Hello and welcome back to the Luckbox podcast. Uh, <laughs> we're back and uh, I'm joined again by Reda. Thanks for jumping in. Always, no problem. Uh, we've got some cool stuff to talk about today because it yes. is a uh, star series I League, oh, I, this season, name, seven. Yep. season seven yep. finals, uh, and it's kicking off this weekend. So It's Counter-Strike, by the way, just in case you're a Dota fan, you tune in, went, Red Eye's talking about Dota. No, he's not. He's talking about Counter-Strike. I do lots of esports. It's, yes. it's fine. Yeah. It's all fine. Um, have you been getting up early and watching? I haven't, actually. You this swine. has been tough. I know. Yeah, because it's in Shanghai, so it's it's a bit, it's not nice for us euros we're getting a bit of a taste of the medicine of what you guys get in north america and uh in asia usually when oh, we we do all of these this is regular life. in europe and you guys have you know i've got to get up at 6 a.m <laughs> and watch Counter strike or i'm going to bed it's 1 a.m no yeah this it's is us, it's this us is this regular time. life for americans i guess i didn't realize yeah. but yeah i'm i struggle because i'm meant to be working during all the games yes <laughs> it's like uh yes yeah, so our poor american north american south american friends have to do this on a regular basis uh, so the know. least we can do is not moan about Okay, Lunch. I have a lot of sympathy. I've also got bags under my eyes Indeed. from trying to Indeed. trying. However, what a funny old tournament this has been, hasn't it? It's yeah. been. It's there's been a lot of upsets. Yeah. And I want. Why don't we kick off? Because yeah. we asked you for your predictions oh God. last week. Yeah. Well, I mean, I just want to say up front, these were heart predictions, not head predictions. Okay. And inevitably, what happens is, if you go with the heart, you you get heartbroken. I'm still going to make fun of you. I would expect nothing <laughs> less of you. Because um, your picks, uh, why don't they, you remind they, me? Well, I got three through the quarterfinals. Well, well, who are your picks then? Um, uh, so, uh, I'm going the other reverse yeah. order, right? So, I figured, right, I went with I went with heart. Yes. So, this is the first one we should okay, take. So I went yeah, with heart. I went with friendships. I went with players that I've known for a very long time or I'm very close to that I wanted to see do well. Um, so, I went with them IBR. And most people will go, oh, that's a cop-out. They're always going to go through anyway. So, hold that thought. Uh, five Brazilians all back together again. And now I'm going to be uh, lots of friends in there. Lots of Taco, Fall in particular, I'm very good friends with. Um, I also went with FaZe. Um, I'm not close friends with all of them, but I have Guardian in there, who I have been a friend of for a very long time, since that boy was a small boy, playing out of Eastern Europe, playing Counter-Strike Source. Um, so, I went with FaZe. Um, I also went with Vitality because my boys, uh, my French boys in there, MBK in particular, again, Nathan I've known for a long time uh, and really want him to do um, really well. Um, I also went with Na'Vi because you can't really have five teams in your arsenal without having the best player in the world in there and Simple's a bit of a boy. Uh, so my lad, no, my boy, no, he's in there. So that's four. Na'Vi. My fifth team was tough actually because I kind of went, okay, who have I got? I've got lots of friends in Counter-Strike obviously but some of the older boys I'm closer to because we've known each other for such a long time. One of those um, it plays for Big um, and, and then two of them play for Nip. So I was like, <laughs> oh God, that's really tough. I've got to choose between Big and Nip. Uh, Oh, I'll go with Nip. Sorry, and sorry, Fatia. If, you, if you're right. watching, you're going, I've, I've disowned Red Eye as a friend anymore. Um, God B, obviously. Uh, well, great, though- great guy. So I went with NIP. So they were my fifth pick. I, the reason I've done it in this order is because when I looked at the five that I picked, I was like, oh God, if Vitality make the quarterfinals here out of these 16 teams, they've done very well. If Nip make the quarterfinals out of these 16 teams, they've done very well. However... I've got Na'Vi, FaZe, and MIBR. So they're going to give me three in the quarters easily. And yeah. guess what? I've got three in the quarterfinals, but they're not the three <laughs> that we thought they would be because FaZe and MIBR somehow shat the bed and didn't make it out of the, yeah. out of the, the group side, which I'm, I'm mind blown. I'm more mind blown by the fact that FaZe went, were two and zero. So they only had to win one more to yeah. make the quarterfinal, and they lost three. In a row. In a row. It's um. What's this? This is Swiss format. It's Swiss I, format. I, I yeah. Guess. First to three. So three gets and you through. Yeah. Needed uh, one uh, more uh, win. Needed one more win out of the so three. So who did they play? Uh, they. I think they, they had uh, phase B. Renegades. Uh, Pain of Ichi, yeah. which is fine. And then they lost to Renegades in a really close battle. They lost to Ents in a really close game, and then they got thrashed by North. Which you're like, oh wow. Well. Um, but I do want to talk about not necessarily my picks because mm. I did get three through. Although I've only got two through now because as we record this right now, I've just seen Actually, that yeah. Vitality lost their first quarterfinal match of the day, which means for, I'm for now clarity. down to two teams. For clarity, uh, it's uh, we're recording Friday morning. Yes. The quarterfinals are currently on, but we'll get this video yep, out quickly. Yep, yep, yep. You'll see. You'll see it by the time this is ended. Yep. But anyway, Vitality are out, so I've now got Nip and Navi are left, and they're both in the other side of the bracket together. Okay. 
<laughs> so anyway, so my chances of even getting one team to the final are pretty slim at the moment. But I, I'm, I'm hope the what I want to talk about though is Fnatic and Renegades. Now uh, look, Fnatic I'm are you know a great team for the great players, but they haven't necessarily had great results, right? Mm. Particularly in the major, for instance, didn't even make legend this time round. I think it's only the second time they've never made legends. So. Not not great form. Um, they had to play NIP, mm. NRG, and Vitality. Not three of the strongest teams in the on tournament paper, either. On paper, on yeah. On paper, not the strongest three teams. However, they won all three, and they won the group. Renegades, on the other hand, had to play Tyloo, which is always a funny game with Tyloo and mm. Rene uh, Renegades because they're they're not from the same region per se, but they are from they play they're in the in same the same region. time zone. <laughs> they play in the same region uh, for Counter Strike purposes, and their battles can often go either way. Yeah. They're, they're very close most of the time. They beat Tylo two zero pretty easily. They then had to beat MIBR, which they did two one, and then they had to beat Phase, which they did. So they've held on. So they've beaten MIBR and Phase and won the group alongside Fnatic. That's unbelievable <laughs> yeah. form. That's fantastic. This is not, not I, what I, I expected am... whatsoever. Ents and Navi just behind them. Yeah. I kind of expected they would get through. Um, which they did. And then the other qualifiers were NRG and North. And, and they've kind of... Eh. NRG actually had to go all five. North was 0-2 and two <laughs> at the start of this group stage and somehow managed to make the qualifiers by going back 3-2. It's the beauty of Counter-Strike, right? But look, look Anyone can beat anyone yeah. on their day. I mean, I'm, we're looking at the results and you can see where they got their wins. They got their wins off MIBR. Yeah. And, uh, they, and got they got their wins off FaZe. Yeah, yeah, that's the shocker. I yeah. mean... It's, it's all a on little paper, bit it is, but it's about form right now. And MIBR are not in form right now. Yeah, people say to me, Oh, but they're the, the you know, the double mm. major champions, guys. It was three years ago, <laughs> that's nine years in esports terms. Like, it's a long freaking time ago that they were dominating the world. They've been a top 14 for a long time, they may have even slipped out of that right now. But they're, they're finding their new way of playing. They're finding a it's not about the people, it's more about the style of play and how they want to go forward with the Counter-Strike, and they're, they're, they're finding their way again. Every team goes through this. Some bounce back. We've seen Virtus Pro, you know, came back and back and back multiple times um, to reach major finals and, and do well. MIBR have to go through the same pain, unfortunately. And FaZe, even weirder, because they're supposed to be the all-star team. They're supposed to be <laughs> the giant killers. They've made one major final and lost it. That's all that's on their achievement list, right? Now, they've won other tournaments, for sure, and, and mm. the, you know, they're rumoured to shout with the Intel Challenge, but Great teams are measured by how many majors they reach and how many majors they win. And Astralis have reached three major finals and they've won all three. Mm. Fnatic reached four major finals and won three. Those are the two big historical teams right now that we can look at and go, these are the greats. MIBR's f roster, as SK and um, before that LG, won two finals in a row in 2016. Mm. They were a great team. There's no doubt about it. They are one of the greats. Are they great right now? No. Well, this, this is a question that comes up, uh, FaZe specifically, is has the experiment failed? Is it time to call it quits? No, I don't think so. Um, and I don't think it's an experiment anymore. If you look at other teams and what they've done, you know, Mouse Sports have now got a multi-international team. Penta had a multi-international team. It, lots of teams, I know Ents is kind of bucking the trend a little bit because they've you know, full fin lineup and they're doing very well. But it's... I think it's more international now than it's ever been before. I don't think you necessarily need to form a core team around one nationality and be successful. I think you can have multinational players that are world-class players in their own right and, and you can mesh them together. The problem for me with FaZe is, uh, and I don't know if fans will agree with this or not, uh, up to them, but this is my view on it. When you look at their success early on, a lot of it was built around... The fact that they had these star players and the power, right? Fragging, raw fragging power. However, the one thing that you could always rely on in that team is that they would have great strategy. They had powerful players, but they had great strategy. They also had great leadership in that team. I don't think they do anymore. And I'm not saying that, you know, Nico's a bad in-game leader or Guardian's a bad in-game leader or any of the other players are. What I'm saying is I think Carrigan is missed. I think he's the missing piece. And when you look at you look at the end of his career with them, and you sort of go, they tailed off a little bit. Well, come on, they were still reaching finals. They were still finishing top four. The problem for them was is that it's a world-class all-star team playing for a world-class organisation. They can't afford to finish fourth. No. They need to be winning titles, right? That's the expectation of that team. But when you look at where they are now, not even getting out of the groups at Star Ladder, in a Swiss format which they should dominate, uh, hello? 
there's something wrong with this team. It's and a it's little not the embarrassing, players, isn't because it? the players are still the players, right? Yeah. They're still world class players. Something is missing. For me, it's, it's the gel. It's the it's the guy that bound them together and got them to do the things that they didn't necessarily want to do, to practice when they wanted to practice, to do the strategies they didn't want to play. He was the guy. Right. And not having him now, I think, is finally showing its impact now. Right, so so it's salvageable, right? They, they, of course they, it is. They, well, they, these players don't just suddenly become shit at the game. No, but but it, it looks bad, like, as we say. It's, it's embarrassing. It's actually embarrassing. For face fans, yes. yeah. And, and what, how do face fans feel about this? Are they going to stick with them? Are they going to start <sighs> I think leaving? they will because they're very loyal. It's a, it's a very loyal fan base, for sure. Um, but it's like every world-class team. When you expect them to be winning majors, not just winning tournaments, like this should be a walk in the park for a team like Fate. They should be able to come here, be one of the top three favourites, mm. go through, knock out some big teams, get into the grand final, at least, the very least, get into the final, if not bring the trophy home. And... They are nowhere near that right now in terms of form, in terms of ability and togetherness and strategy. They're nowhere near it. So something has to change again. Mm. Um, and they've already made one change and it's made them worse. <laughs> and they've made several changes, actually, yeah. if I'm honest. But I mean, in one team change. What's next? I don't know. I okay. honestly don't know. But is it an experiment? I don't think it's an experiment anymore. I think we, yeah. they, they've proved many times before that this can work. It's about how do they get back to that. Mm. But it's, it's going to be interesting watching. Yeah. From, and then yeah, from a neutral's point of view, anyway. Jumping back to MIBR yeah. again. Um, for example, my impression was, oh, look, they've got this is five Brazilian team. Yeah. It's going to be easy. They just slide in. There's, yeah. nothing, there's no work to do. Oh. They're going to gel together. Like it, it should be child's play now for them to, but to get have the, the performance. I think here. they have the opposite problem yeah. to phase. I think they do have that togetherness. They do have the strategy. They do have, oh, maybe not, it's specifically uh, the strategy. Taco in game? Yeah, ta no, I've fallen uh, Taco. I mean, they, they mix it around. Okay. But the point is, they have five players who know each other really well. That gelling issue is not an issue, I don't think, with that team. I think it's more that Counter Strike has changed in, in the fundamentals, in the way that it's played. Um, there's lots of changes to money and guns and map pools and what have you. I think the new map pool might favour them a little bit more, but we're talking minute stuff, right? What's changed for them is that they've they've had success for such a long time. Yeah. Uh, two majors in 2016, plenty of victories in 2017 and 2018 for that matter as well. And and now it's harder. It's much harder. Not not just motivation wise, but it's 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 a harder game. It's a more competitive game. I feel like three or four years ago, most teams were ranged anywhere from say say you know the game. If you played it perfectly, every round, every single gun, every bullet is 100. percent I would say most players were somewhere between 85 and 95%. I'm talking about the top 100 players in the world. They were probably somewhere between 85 and 95. Okay. So a top player in a 16th seeded team playing a top player in a first rated team would still get beat. And you'd see that clearly because there was a 10% steal yeah. difference, if you like, for argument's sake. Now I feel like it's so competitive that they're probably somewhere between 94 and 97%. Right, and it's much closer. Yeah, so that, and that I'm talking about the top 16 yeah. teams, top 100 players in the world, right? So there's only a few percent in the skill difference mm. now in terms of what you can actually do in the game that's physically possible in the game. And some players defy that. Nico's done it in the past. Simple's done it in the past. There's a few players that can, can do that and go maybe to 98%, but it's only every now and again. It's not consistent enough, right? But consistently, 94 to 97 percent. So you have to ask yourself, well, so how do we stand out now? Much harder, right? Yeah. Every, so everyone can aim. Now. Absolutely. <laughs> right? like it's not about aim anymore. You it's not just, about positioning. You can't just peek a corner and expect to always win absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it, it, it's about special moments and whether you can step up. Zipniks, for instance, are, are strides. I still don't think he gets the credit he deserves. Um, I know everyone calls him the clutchmeister, and that's fine. But but watch his game. Watch how intelligent he is. Watch watch how smart he plays, right? It's quite incredible to watch through his eyes and see the decision-making that's going on. And he's making those decisions in fractions of a second and then snapping onto heads mm. and rolling people out. And he's doing it in 1v2s, in 1v3s, in 1v4s, right? Occasionally 1v5s. But it, my point is more that he is a player that is able, at a specific time, in a moment in a game, he's able to rise above that 97%. Mm. Not many players are. 
And so you need yeah. you need something in the game to be able to stand out. And unfortunately, MIBR are in the middle of a big pack of players and teams who are all around about the 96% skill mark, and therefore they can't just go in and frag anymore. They can't just go in and be cold zero on a ledge, no scoping people through windows. They can't do that stuff anymore the same way that they did three, four years ago. What they've got to do is go back to some fundamental stuff, I think, um, and... You know, what do I know about strategy and counter <laughs> these days? But what I can tell you is the more I watch it these days, it is a much, much tougher game to be really outstanding at. And these are the players that were. No, I, li I like that point of view. I, I remember so when I was playing Quake, there were times when I didn't even need to engage my no, brain. Because you, you know what? I'll just, I'll just run at them and I'll out-aim them. Yes. It's like, I don't need to think. Yeah. But you didn't have to time weapons and items and everything else yeah. because it didn't matter. But again, but I don't think that don't think that's interesting for esports. I don't think that makes an interesting viewing experience for a longer term. In the immediate term, you know, the spinning, yeah, like instant rail yeah, shot, yeah. just that headshot in Counter Strike, I mean, it shots. looks great. Yeah, yeah, they're the movie shots. Right? Yeah. We'd all like to pull them off now and again so we featured in the frag movies afterwards, but yeah. but actually, they don't win matches. And, and that's not why people tune in as well. I think people. Oh, I don't know. I think people do. Yeah, sometimes. I think they do. I, know, I, mean, I, I, I love. Look, yeah. I, I don't particularly like Navi's style of play. Mm. I don't like the way that Zeus organizes his team, right? Yeah. It's just a, a personal preference, nothing against you, so it's effective, it works. But I, it's just not a, a style of play that I enjoy. Likewise, Vici, the way that Vici played Dota, I don't enjoy that. I don't know. It's better recently, more recently it's much better. Last year was hopelessly horror. <laughs> I, I just had so much disdain for Vici in yeah. Dota because it was disgusting Dota. I hated watching them play, right? And a lot of people didn't like Rat Dota before with a sh with uh, with Alliance. Yeah. There are there are things that you happen in your games that you just don't enjoy, right? So for me, I don't enjoy watching Na'Vi play. However, I will watch Na'Vi play. Why? Because you see these amazing options. Because you, so you never know what you might see mm. from Simple at yeah. some point in the game. Yeah. I don't know if that's the right way of approaching it, but it, in my world, it's the same as saying, I don't really like watching Juventus play in Serie A right now because they're boring. Yeah. They're really boring, and they're walking Serie A. They're absolutely destroying everyone. But I still watch. Why do I watch? Cristiano Ronaldo. Yeah. Because you never know you what the guy's going to do, right? And he's going to do something spectacular. So I do. So I think people do tune in okay. to watch these. The reason I brought that up, though, I mean, you mentioned Dota. I won't talk about Dota too much. But there's an open AI match coming up yes. uh, with OG. Yes. And, you know, th this is what, what makes me think is like, what I love is when a team comes together in any esport yep. and outwits their opponent yeah. through their strategy, through their understanding of how everyone's uh, going to uh, react to them. I right? agree, and I, I think that's um, it's another way of watching, right? Yeah. It, it, yeah. it, it appeals to you because you're a smart guy, you're intelligent, and you like that style, you like the cerebral part of, yeah. of video games. But right? it, and I get it's, that, it's but my, not everyone uh, enjoys that. Well, I'm a, it's my... Um, Backlash against the 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 robot uprising, right? Because <laughs> I don't want OpenAI to win. No, I really don't. I don't either. Because it, I I just feel really sad. I think. Yeah. So so well, I'm now not tuning in five years from now, <laughs> or going off to Mumbai to commentate on a video game that's basically yeah. two bot teams. <laughs> yeah. I'm not doing it. Yeah. Like, I'll, I'll shoot myself before that so, happens. So so in my mind, you know what make okay, and I'm I, I know this. I'm polarizing this a bit. It's like I I love the fact that even if a computer can time everything perfectly. The human can outthink yes. by out strategizing uh, what's going on. You know, just yep. just do something that's beyond a oh, if you're quick enough, you can beat me. No, yeah. this is outthinking. Yeah, I can learn ten thousand games of Dota or Counter Strike and figure out what I should optimally mm. do as a bot. That's what you can do, right? Yeah. But they can't figure out how to spontaneously react. Mm. They can only go by a set of parameters. Therefore, for my mind, it'll always be more enjoyable watching a human being. Yeah. For their flaws as well as their brilliance. <laughs> I mean, I, I think you have to have those moments, right? Yeah. I've watched Simple have some horrific matches. <laughs> I've watched Eternal Envy have some unbelievably horrific matches, right? But I've also seen him buy three rapiers in a game and destroy <laughs> another team. Yeah. So that's fun. Yeah. I, uh, Eternal Envy is not my favourite player to watch, but he is a player I will watch because, in my mind at least, and the way that he plays Dota, he's, he's on a knife edge of brilliance, genius, and stupidity. There is a, a fine line between the two, and, and he is one of those that embodies that perfectly. There are other players who are very good, and they're very steady, and they'll very rarely ever make mistakes, but they'll very rarely ever make the kind of plays that Eternal Envy has ever made in his life. They'll never get close to the top 10 on his, which is why they're good players, right? Yeah. No, don't take anything away from them. But I like 
the miracles, the moments. Mm -hmm. I like the Samael storm spirits yeah. coming back from five deaths in the first five. I like those games. God, you love when Simple suddenly clutches a... Of a, course. Like yeah. he's jumping off a ledge in midair <laughs> and he's headshotting people with an orb with no scope. And what's that all about? How can you even think that yeah, that's well. going to work? No, yeah, How right. would you even try <laughs> that in practice? How would you do that? Because mm. that's... That's the brilliance of esports for me, right? It's the brilliance of any game, whether it's Counter Strike, Dota, League of Legends, it doesn't matter. Those are the brilliant moments. They are the the I'm Gareth Bale overhead kick in a Champions League final moments mm. for us, right? And I would love to be able to express that better and explain that better to, to a mainstream audience because then I think they would get it. They'd be like, oh, we get why. We don't like it still, but we get why you guys love it so much. And this is why we put them on big stages because yeah. we get those moments. And and then all the crowd yes. says, I was there. Yeah. And I saw, I was do there you know in the, the crowd when do that you know happened. One of the funniest things about these, um, these moments that happen. Mm. The further away you get from it in time, the more people claim to have been there. <laughs> okay. Do you not think that's true? Like, ask anyone who yeah. was born in the 40s and the 50s, what was the greatest sporting moment for England in the <laughs> 60s? Right? Yeah. What would they say? Yeah, they they would say the World, World Cup, Cup final 1966. Oh, I was there. Oh, yeah, no, I was there. It's brilliant. There were 100,000 people in that crowd, but a million people have claimed to actually be there, yeah. right? In a similar sense... We ran something called Kovlan, hmm. Kovlan 3, I think in I went 2006, that, I? right? Was I at that one? You were at that one. Or did and I just make that up? Now I'm not see, sure. There, see, <laughs> there, not sure. There were 33 people at that event, including the two commentators and all the players and spectators and managers. Ben Wood was one of those people that was there that didn't play, for instance. Only Stuart and I were there to commentate, and we did it in audio. To this day, it's legendary now because it was the... the, the incredible draw in TDM between Four Kings and Dignitas. The two biggest teams in the UK at the time, the two biggest sets of players, Too Good was playing in the game as well. It had some incredibly you know, gifted Quake players from many years before. It actually ended as a tie in a TDM match, <laughs> which very, as you well know, never happened. Like, I, think, I think I had one game in about 10 years that ever ended like the that. The score right? lines tend to be in triple figures. Absolutely. And, and this was 226 versus 226, <laughs> and the buzzer went. And I was yeah. like, I don't know actually, why. does it go to overtime? Yeah, it automatically five minutes of overtime. Unbelievably, it then went to a second overtime, <laughs> which I'd never seen in my entire, and I've still never seen it either. Right? And I've played thousands upon thousands of TDM mm. matches. Anyway. That's why it's a legendary tournament, because that happened. And then we had triple overtime in the 1v1 final between Wins and Fuki. So, incredible event. It was held in a community centre in Coventry. Hmm. It didn't have a crowd. It didn't have spectators. It didn't have an entrance fee. We literally kicked a ball about in a cage outside. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> during the day. like It was, it was just us, 30-odd people. Yeah. There are so many people now that claim, oh, yeah, I went to that. No, you didn't, mate. I was there. I no, yeah, I, I did. No, I turned up on the second. No, you didn't. A, there's a gallery on ES Reality that you put up, yes. which is brilliant. Yeah. I, I remember. Like, It's really yeah. good you got yeah, that because yeah. every yeah. time I look at that, it's like, oh, I remember that. Yeah. Time. No, and, it's, uh, and, and you talk to anyone that was yeah. there or anyone that has heard, because we only did audio shoutcasting back then and from, from the event, we couldn't afford to do live video. Incredible, isn't it? <laughs> um, but... Afterwards, Rams, R2K, turned it into a video and matched our commentary to oh. it from the demo. So there is a video on YouTube, and I did one as well for ITG. It's very low quality. But Rams did a great job of piecing the two together. So now people think, no, yeah, I watched that. No, yeah. you didn't know, because we didn't stream it live, you morons. But it's, it's a, I'm using it as a case in point, because there are hundreds of people now that say they were at the event, and there are thousands that say they watched it. Mm. If Live. you want to watch some Quake, by the way, go check that. It's probably on YouTube somewhere. <laughs> yeah, right. Go and watch him. Look up Sue Joy. He was quite good back in the day. Quite good. Not brilliant, but he was quite good. Uh, but I mean, that's my point is, is that those moments come yeah. along, right? We have those moments in esports. XPK's back door at the yeah. League of Legends yeah, Intel Extreme Masters well, uh, semi finals against yeah. SK. It's a legendary moment. I was sat in the middle of the, the, the stage, very privileged to be able to go on and interview both of the players afterwards, play my small part in that historic part of esports and it is a magical moment you watch it it doesn't matter what game you play whether you're a dota fan or a league fan or whatever you are it's a magical piece of esports history yeah we we see that we uh, there's the um the street fighter uh there's uh, the play in dota when the play is and incredible there's, six million dollar echo is, slam and you, and it's, there's so many different and I, and I, i'm gonna i will kind of i almost wanted to say oh i'm sick of them but i'm not every time no. it comes on i do get a little yeah. chill because I see it and I'm like, I feel good yeah. about watching this. And I've seen it, I've probably seen it a hundred times, yeah. each of these things. <laughs> yeah, but make, yeah, you're make right. great by the players, the teams, 
the tournaments and the casters, obviously, as well. Yeah. Um, and we have those moments. Yeah. And we just need to do a better job of, I don't know how we got on this track, but we need to do a better job of getting that out there into the mainstream and saying, look, these are, these are our Gareth Bale overhead kick moments in a Champions League yeah. final. These, this is what it's special to us. Well, on this subject, though, I wanted to, to take it to um, Star Ladder in Shanghai. Yes. Uh, is it? I, it's I in say, Shanghai. I don't know if it's the first time, actually, but it's I-League, so uh, they've got the Chinese connection already. I don't know if they've Anyways. done one. I've, I've certainly done but CS in Shanghai, though. I did it yeah. last year. Yeah, it's not uh, new, but yeah. uh, Shanghai, Shanghai is obviously very much 2019 in the news. Yeah. Esports, from, especially from the West, is coming there. Counter-Strike yeah. is there now. And, um, T. I. Like, how do you think it's going? How do you think it's being... Uh, accepted in Shanghai. Um, well, Counter Strike. Well, Counter Strike and Dota and esports in general. Well, um, I think I think Counter Strike's had a bit of a checkered career, but mainly because in China CS Online has always been more popular. Yeah, of course. Um, CS:GO was officially released there last year. Yeah, amazingly, um, had big billboards. You up think Counter Strike has been around forever? Right, exactly. <laughs> but it was officially released there last year, so I think that's helped. Yeah. Um, I think the success of teams like Vici and Tai Lu in particular that have done very well coming out of China. Um, has probably helped the popularity of the game as well. You have to have torchbearers in every region. Um, in Dota, Korea has always been really bad. Um, but we've had MVP and they've put up a couple of teams in the past and then it generated a bit more interest. I think, again, it's gone backwards a little uh, bit J now. But J-Storm are doing okay. But J-Storm are doing okay. And I, I think it's it's kind of holding on. And March is, is the main man that has led to that kind of popularity or yeah. increasing popularity. But you need, you so need, you need, torch you need a role model. Yeah, torch bearers. Absolutely, yeah, word. and role models as well. Um, and I think Vici and Tyler have done that and they've been around for a long time, those organisations, a long time, particularly Tyler. I remember Tyler back in 2005, so they've been around a long time. And that's helped. I think releasing the game has helped. I think holding tournaments there has helped. But when you look at the crowds, um, they're not as big. They, they don't have, fill the stadiums the same We haven't hit the, the weekend yet. Let's, let's, no, no, let's but I, and this isn't anything to do with Star Ladder or I League. It's just do the game and the popularity mm. of the game out in China. It's not as big as Dota. By a, it's a fraction of the size of Dota, which is huge. In fact, Warcraft 3 is still bigger than Counter-Strike in China <laughs> right now, as hard as that is to believe. Yeah. It still fills small arenas. It still invites people like Todd and Grubby back to China to play because it's still massively popular. I think if Warcraft 4 ever comes out, Everything else will die in China except for Warcraft 4. Like every other game will just be done <laughs> um, because they'll be just all over Warcraft 4. Um, so it's up against a lot of competition. And generally speaking, the Asian countries, particularly China, have not been historically good at, at FPS games. And that's mm -hmm. partly why. They've always been much better at the MOBAs, much better at the RTS games. So, you know, they're battling League of Legends, which is huge in China. They're battling Dota, which is huge in China. They're battling Warcraft 3, which is still huge in China. That, that's a lot to get through mm -hmm. before you've even started to progress. And then on top of that, mobile gaming in China is enormous. Mm -hmm. Millions of players playing in qualifiers to get to national finals. And so not just millions of players, millions of viewers. Absolutely. You know, I mean, the viewership's crazy in China, mm. but then you know, we're, we're multiplying by a factor of 10. So if you get 100,000 followers on Twitch, you probably get a million in, in China mm. just because of what you're doing. Um, it, it's just, it is bonkers. So, yeah. I mean, viewership aside, because we, we always sort of flaunch a little bit of that stuff, I, I think CS generally has done okay yeah. um, in the last year or so to become more popular in China, but it's still got a long way to go no, to have the same enough, popularity. Um, games like PUBG have started yeah. to take off in China. Yeah, they have. Um, and I think, that, again, it's it's um, it's a widening of the appeal yeah. for Chinese fans. They've traditionally been RTS fans and, and MOBA fans, and, and there are obviously FPS fans out there as well, but I think it's growing. I think that's probably the fastest growing of all the genres right now. And it's down to games like PUBG and Fortnite and, uh, and Counter-Strike coming out as well. But, it, you know, it's tough for Counter-Strike down there. It isn't the preeminent, top-rated FPS game that everyone's playing. CS Online is still very popular mm. down there, and it's it's almost like a version of 1.6, but online. Yeah. And it's the game that they prefer to play in a similar way that StarCraft you know, wasn't... StarCraft 2 wasn't the most popular game in Korea. In fact, they're still playing Brood War on TV in, in Korea right now. You know, to this day, they're still playing Brood War. Yeah. So... There might be some of that element there. Um, I don't know that it's that embedded. But if you look at the players in Vici and Tyler, a lot of them have got CS Online backgrounds. Yeah, and, and I I mean, we, we've seen games through the years. There's always resistance to the next version yes. from Quake 1 well, to Quake 2, for example. Particularly if they example, don't get from anything from it. Like, why would you move? 
Let's use you as an example. Why do you move from Quake 1, where you're very good, winning mm. tournaments, going off being a national superstar, why are you going to move to Quake 2? Especially as Quake 2 was awful. Well, it wasn't. <laughs> it was a bloody good game. I liked it a lot. Puri liked it a lot. You sucked at it. Therefore, why would you move? Is my point, right? Oh, please. Can we, I, you know what? I, I'll have an hour-long rant about why. Right. Anyway, but happy let's to not play, get into Happy that. to play you in Quake 2. Bit of DM6. No problem at all, if that's what you want. Leave and pick a map that you know. <laughs> yes, you See, know, he's, I, he's, he's not no. quite. So if it was Quake One, Quake World, he'd be like, "Yeah, bring it on," because he was I bloody know. good at it. He was bloody good at it. But Quake Two was Puri's domain. Okay, sorry, I have to say one thing. Quake One, yes, a lot more freedom, dynamic movement, yeah, air control. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's like saying, but you know what? Let's not it's get like into saying it. Quake Three's got more air control than Quake Two. Of course, it has. Quake Two. Anyway, no, because no, it didn't have any. We're That's gonna, why we're going to talk. I Different go. game. Horses for courses. I was the same. Look, yes. Unreal Tournament. Loved Unreal Tournament original. Yes. Unreal Tournament 2003, not so much. Yeah. Not so much. Not so, really so, yeah, the same so, kind of game. So there's resistance. Yes, there there, and and yes. that's the thing. But I, in my heart, I, I hope and I, f I feel like when things like PUBG start getting p uh, FPS games yeah. into the consciousness, there's always, um, there's always a feeling of, look, we want to climb the ladder. And this is something I felt is sure. when I started playing Quake very seriously, I thought, this is great. Now, what's my next step? No, sure. And I what's understand, the step but after I think, that? I think that it's, it starts with a fundamental enjoyment of what you're playing. Yeah. I think that's where all of these things are driven from. It's why I really liked Unreal Tournament, because I just really liked the world that it was set in. I loved the maps. I loved the guns. I loved the colors. I loved the setting. I loved the backstory. I loved everything about Unreal Tournament. It gave me something that Quake didn't quite give me in that respect. But was Quake a better game? Probably, yeah. From a physical point of view, it was definitely a better game. But Unreal Tournament gave me something that I hadn't felt, mm. felt emotional attachment yeah. to other games. I then, because I loved it so much and enjoyed it so much, I then started playing it more. I inevitably, you then get better at it. Mm. When you reach a certain point and you've joined a team and you're starting playing on international ladders, you're going to lands, then you're like, oh, hold on, how far can I go? Then it becomes about how far can I go? I don't think many players truly switch games because they love the game that they, they're they playing. They, they see prize money in another they game. They see prize money, they see that, teams, yeah. they see tournaments pop up, they want to go play. Look at someone like Garpy, um, Zachibus, two very well, you know, world famous UK based players, been very successful in multiple Garpy, games. Just one of the most talented players I've ever incredible seen. Incredible FPS player, yeah. like incredible player. I played him in an Unreal Tournament tournament mm. once where he'd never played the game. He ended up in the grand final against me. The yeah. guy's nuts. He's so good. Half-Life Deathmatch World yeah. Champion, Painkiller Champion player. He's done so many different games yeah. and, and obviously playing Quake again now. But my point about it is that he has never moved game because he was in love with the next game. He's moved because he's had to, mm. because he's a, he's a professional pro gamer and he needs to earn money and he needs to get prize money and he needs to play for a team, right? And that's what he loves. He enjoys that side of his life. If he had a choice, I'm sure he'd be back playing Half-Life Deathmatch. If there were world championships for yeah. it, he would be yeah. probably a multiple world champion for it now. Yeah. Because he was unbelievably good at it. And that's what he loved playing. He loved that game. He really genuinely enjoyed playing. No, you're right. And sometimes you forget that if you're just spectating. I think this is why I'm, I bring this up again, not to give you a hard time and give you shit, but, although I do. But I think that's why you loved Quake 1, because you were. You, yeah. you kind it of loved it. Game. It was your game. You enjoyed it. You grew with it. You learned as you went along. You played at a high level in it. And then when Quake 2 came out, it was so different. It was so fundamentally flawed in comparison to Quake One that you were just like, "No, I'm not. I'm. I'm not moving because why would I move to that shit? I love this game. I love playing this game. I don't love playing that game." Yeah. That was where your your difference came, and obviously back then we didn't have the same kind of money that we have now. Had we had the same amount of money, I'm not so sure that you wouldn't have switched and and put more effort in. I think you would. Well, I mean, for for Counter Strike, it was 1.6 to Source. That was the really yeah, questionable. Yeah, but, no, but no one really moved. Yeah, because. Because it was a completely different game. And and honestly, when Source came out, it was horrible. Yeah. Horrible. Their hitboxes were unbelievably bad. Yeah. Like worse than they were from people that went from Source to CSGO or even 1.6 to CSGO. People moaned about the hitboxes back then because they were all out of sync with the actual models. Mm. In Source, pfft, that never got fixed for six years. Yeah. Like, forget about it. Like You had to figure out where the models were. You never aimed at the player. You aimed before or afterwards, depending on where... Yeah, Ter it was terrible a terrible game to Absolutely. start with. And it did get fixed and it did get better and it was a very competitive scene. Mm. And some of the players that played the game have proved since 
they were world class players. Guardian, for instance, came from Counter Strike Source. Dupree came from Counter Strike Source. MBK came from Counter Strike Source. Uh, Fifth Laren, who won a major with NIP in the early days, also from Counter Strike Source. Freibo from Counter Strike Source. Mm. There was plenty of great players that came from it, alongside some great players that came from 1.6. Luckily for us, Go was the game that merged the two. Yeah, and Go and brought them back together yeah. again. And Go is good. Yes. <laughs> well, they... but it wasn't to start with either. No. No. Like when it first came out, it was a wretched game. Okay, I didn't it play it when it first came out. It was very bad. Okay. Very bad in 2011, 2012, and it was a bit. It was a horrible game. Okay. Um, luckily for us, Valve came back and fixed it. Not a phrase that you but, hear often. Um, but, but that step from CS Online to CSGO should yes. be an easier step now. Um, it it's it's looks so much it better. It should be, but my point still holds in that players that are earning money for a professional team, winning matches, winning tournaments in CS Online, why would they switch to CSGO other than for the challenge? Well, for the challenge makes them the fifth best team in China, so they no longer win all the prize money. It also makes them the 50th best team in the world. And actually, hold on, we're the best team in the world mm. in our game right now. Why would we? Yeah, It's like moving from Hon to Dota. It, a lot of teams have done it, but many stayed behind. You look at look at what happened to Kyle and, and uh, Z-Freak, right? Mm. They stayed in Hon. They were world champions. They were the best team on planet Earth for a, well, a I, long time, right? I'd never heard of them, actually, when, okay. until they came but, but to they Dota. Ca- but they came to Dota. Yeah. Sure, they qualified for their first TI a year into their career. But they crashed out really early, and they didn't win a single major tournament. Mm. That's that's hard to go from that, isn't it? So why is the move? Well, there's two reasons for that move. One was they wanted to prove themselves that they weren't just good in Hon, which is a great point, and some I think that does hold true. But they also knew that the prize money was there as well. They could earn more by finishing 16th in Dota than they could by winning tournaments in Hon. Yeah. So different reason, right? Mm. They didn't move across because they were suddenly like, right, we're done with that. We, we've, we've won everything we can win, and now we're going to move on, and we're going to do everything we want in it. They thought they could. Same way that Fly did when he came across from Hon, and, and No Tail did, and PPD did. They all thought that when they came. And some have been successful. Mm. Some haven't. Yeah. Well, it's yeah, hard to it's move. Tough. It's tough anyway. Um, but uh, we've got the whole weekend of yes. Star Series yes. ahead of us. All weekend. Yeah, so I'm um, looking forward to that. that looking uh, forward to waking up early <laughs> every morning on a weekend off. <laughs> it's daylight savings, actually. It's not as bad as it, it would have been bad. last week. No, so, so yeah, so we're looking forward to that. So, yes. um, fantastic. Thanks for mm. joining us on this. No worries. <laughs>